welcome back in the last class we discussed about the sensitivity of nmr signal and utilizing the boltzmann equation we worked out what happens to the sensitivity as a function of magnetic field and what happens when we lower the temperature we discussed and we came to a situation i also explained to you that sensitivity depends upon diamagnetic ratio gamma and of course we know this delta a is given by this by this equation gamma h cross b not over 2 pi which is equal to h nu it means larger the magnetic field larger the energy and higher the sensitivity i also mentioned higher the gamma higher the sensitivity this is what we have to understand now and of course we all know among all the stable nuclei i mentioned several times earlier also the proton is the one which has the highest gamma as a consequence this proton detection of the proton signal is more sensitive compared to any other nmr active nuclei i repeat the sensitivity of the detection of the proton signal is much more compared to any other nmr active nuclei because of its highest gamma now the sensitivity depends upon three factors one the magnetic moment mu second population difference between the energy states and the magnetic flux in the induced in the coil all these factors depend on gamma each of these individual terms depends on gamma so what does it mean the total sensitivity dash is given by gamma cube it depends upon gamma cube because each of them depends upon gamma so now let us understand how the sensitivity depends for the different nuclei with the different gamma compared to proton which is highly sensitive in the sense relatively let us compare the sensitivity of proton with that of carbon and nitrogen 15 okay the ratio of sensitivity of proton to that of carbon is given by gamma cube of proton divided by gamma cube of carbon of course we get into the, we also get other terms like into 10 to the power of 7 into radians per tesla per second because these two factors are same both in the numerator and the denominator and they get cancels out as a consequence i am retaining only these two terms so 10 to the power of 7 term i have removed it so these are two just numbers plug it into your calculator you will find this is 63 that means the sensitivity of carbon carbon 13 compared to that of proton is 63 times lower remember it is 63 times lower what happens to nitrogen 15 let us look at nitrogen 15 same we can calculate nitrogen 15 has a gamma minus 2.7116 of course it has negative magnetic moment now this negative as far as the sensitivity is concerned when i am comparing the relative i am not worried about this sign but it is important in some experiments let us not worry about it right now okay let us not worry about it but it is important later so this number again plug these numbers into your calculator you will find this is minus 
So nitrogen 15 is even more less sensitive compared to that of proton. If you have to detect that nitrogen 15 compared to proton, it is really a difficult task because of its extremely low sensitivity relatively compared to even that of carbon. Okay. Of course, the sign, as I said, is because of negative magnetic moment of nitrogen 15. So, general conclusion is compared to proton detection, carbon is 63 times less sensitive, and, uh, and nitrogen 15 is 960 times less sensitive. Okay. But another important factor which you must consider is the sensitivity of detection also depends on the natural abundance of the isotope. Remember, it also depends upon the natural abundance of the isotope. We all know some of these nuclei like proton is 99.98% abundant. Fluorine and phosphorus are isotopes with 100% abundance. Of course, I mean, more or less you can consider all the three are 100% abundant. <laughs> and these are relative, relatively more sensitive for detection. Of course, among the three, proton is more sensitive than fluorine, than phosphorus, because you remember, I showed in one of the classes, the table of properties of various NMR active nuclei, the gamma of proton and the gamma of fluorine are more or less nearly equal, but still less than that of proton. And gamma of phosphorus is nearly 2.5 times less than that of proton. Understand, gamma of phosphorus is 2.5 times less than that of proton. In spite of the fact they are 100% abundant, this is relatively more sensitive compared to the remaining fluorine and phosphorus that you were, I have taken as examples. Okay. Let us look, look at some other nuclei. Carbon-13. 1.1% abundant. Nitrogen-15 abundance is 0.37%. Oxygen-17 even lower. Silicon is relatively better, 4.7%. All these are isotopes with very low natural abundance. There are many. I mean, in the entire periodic table, I have just chosen a couple of them. For example, what does it mean? What does sensitivity will tell us? What do we understand from that? Of course, we discuss this as we go ahead in many classes. Take, for example, we have 100 molecules containing only one carbon, single carbon I'm talking. In that, because carbon-13 is 1.1% abundant and carbon-12 is 99% abundant, it means in 100 molecules, 99 molecules pertain to isotopomer containing carbon-12. Only one molecule is carbon-13 isotopomer. Remember, if I have a molecule containing, 100 molecules containing single carbon, I'll be detecting only one molecule in that. This I took as an example. In a realistic situation, we take sample, in the, the volume of the sample in the NMR tube, which will show you, I will show you later, about three to four centimeter length we take. In a five millimeter, inner diameter tube. You can calculate the volume. Then you know, you can calculate the number of molecules present using Avogadro number, everything. In spite of that, you have to find out how many molecules, how many number of isotopomers will be there in that entire sample volume, which contains carbon-13. So it, even then, the sensitivity of detection is much, much lower, okay? As a consequence, detection of such low sensitive nuclei is even more difficult compared to that of proton, fluorine, and phosphorus I mentioned. Relatively, they're much lower, lower in sensitivity. 
okay i also tell i we calculated sensitivity of carbon and nitrogen related to that of proton now at that time we did not take into account natural abundance now factor that also into sensitivity calculation what is going to happen this factor we knew we worked out the gyro magnetic ratios it was 63 cube of gyro magnetic ratios now let us factor abundance also into account take that proton is 99.98 this is 1.108 if you multiply plug these numbers into your calculator and it turns out to be around 5600 or 5700 is a number that means taking all the factors into account including natural abundance the sensitivity of the detection of carbon 13 compared to that of protons is nearly 5700 times smaller less sensitive carbon 13 is nearly 5700 times less sensitive than that of proton okay let us look at nitrogen 15 nitrogen 15 now the, bring in the abundance factor it is 0.37 this turns out to be 259407 approximately 2.6 lakhs times less sensitive compared to proton imagine the detection sensitivity how much difficult it is if you have to see the nitrogen 15 in natural abundance when compared to proton nevertheless nothing to be worried we can detect nitrogen 15 in the present day spectrometers thanks to many developments technological advancements now we can even detect nitrogen 15 in natural abundance of course with little bit of difficulty it is not uh, absolutely impossible we can do that of course next other thing there are number of sensitivity sensitivity enhancement techniques are also available in addition to what we can play with like increasing the magnetic field lowering the temperature we also can think of few things which we can play with for example electronically we can do some developments that is it is possible we can take care of reducing the noise by using special probes called cryo probes because when you are detecting the signal in the rf coil you also invariably detect noise noise also is part of the signal you are going to detect it this is called thermal noise this thermal noise contains all the frequencies spread over the entire region of the spectrum to overcome this difficulty in the cryo probes the rf coil is maintained at cryogenic temperature of liquid helium which is 4.2k at that temperature the thermal noise is quite a bit reduced <clears throat> then the signal to noise ratio will significantly go up understand that is a very important thing in addition to that can you do some something experimentally it is possible there are number of techniques we have of course we can design by using and by understanding the spin dynamics some experimental techniques have been developed for example polarization transfer technique it means we can transfer the magnetization of the abundant spin like proton which is more sensitive more sensitive means it has more magnetization more that i will take that magnetization i will tell you what is magnetization as we go ahead maybe in this class or next class we will discuss about bulk magnetization etc plus please remember the term magnetization is we in simple terms you remember the population difference okay we can, this has more population difference compared to other less abundant less sensitive nuclei we can take that magnetization of protons give it to carbon 
or nitrogen, which are less abundant or less sensitive, then their, in, their sensitivity will go up. Like it is taxing the rich, paying the poor. We can do that. Tax proton nuclei, take their magnetization, give it to carbon and detect it. And you see, this sensitivity will go up. These are all experimental techniques. It is also possible. So we can uh, understand some of these things as we go ahead in this course in the next couple of classes. With this, now let us look at resonance frequencies of different nuclei in different magnetic fields. This we have already discussed. Let us say I have to see five different nuclei in different magnetic fields. One, let us look at the magnetic field of 4.68 Tesla in that proton resonates at 200 megahertz, carbon is four times smaller, 50 megahertz, and nitrogen resonates at 20 megahertz. We keep increasing the magnetic field, double it or more, now it is doubled. All the frequencies, resonating frequencies got doubled. So in the high frequency spectrometer, Proton comes at 400 megahertz, carbon 100 megahertz, nitrogen 15 is 40 megahertz. You can go ahead. 11.74 Tesla, proton comes at 500 megahertz, carbon at 125 megahertz, and nitrogen 15 at 50 megahertz. This is an advantage. As you go to higher and higher frequencies, when you want to detect different nuclei, there are many advantages. The sensitivity will also go up as if there is going to be a lot of chemical shift dispersion also. One important, I will tell you what is chemical shift and everything. There is a better, you remember, there is better resolution will be there. Spectral resolution will become much better as we go to higher and higher magnetic fields. Supposing if I go below, let us say at five, 50 megahertz or 100 megahertz, the detection of such nuclei or even lower resonating frequencies like silver or ruthenium, such nuclei, whose resonating frequency is much, much smaller, maybe in, let us say, at uh, 300 or 200 megahertz, lead and other things may come, not uh, silver, for example, may come at uh, 5 or 10 megahertz, less than that. Such nuclei, at that frequency, if you want to detect, you get into problems, other problems called acoustic ringing. When you have to detect low gamma nuclei, you get into what is called acoustic ringing. So on the other hand, we can partially address many of such problems by going to higher and higher magnetic fields. Now let us look at the table of NMR active nuclei. There are a number of nuclei which is, you can see, which are NMR active. All of them are color, and you can see the color code given here. This red color means they are spin half nuclei. This yellow means spin the three body nuclei, like that. You can see by and large, I don't know about this, is a white color, whether they are NMR active or they have not been investigated, I don't know. By and large, you can see almost Every element in this periodic table can be studied because many of them are, most of, the, most of them are NMR active. Let us compare the relative sensitivity of different nuclei, relatively. At, let us say at 250 megahertz, if you have to compare the relative sensitivities of all the nuclei or selected nuclei, We'll take proton as the standard, as a reference. You know, proton is high, highly sensitive as far as the detection is concerned compared to all other nuclei. Let us call it 100%. Under identical conditions, when we record the spectrum of other nuclei, what will be their signal-to-noise ratio compared to that of proton? If you see that, fluorine is almost about 80-85% less uh, sensitivity is 85% compared to that of proton. 
come to this nuclei here in this range look at carbon 13 which is another exotic nuclei which we always study organic chemistry people cannot do away with carbon because carbon is present in their molecules they have to see carbon nuclei apart from proton but look at its sensitivity related to that of proton you can hardly see the signal next best is lithium sodium and aluminum they are very good boron but come to this region for example nitrogen 14 or nitrogen 15 hardly you are seeing the signal related to proton so this is this gives you an idea how less sensitive other nuclei are and what are the difficulties involved if you want to detect such nuclei okay these are the things special attention is drawn for carbon and this is less sensitive compared to proton and fluorine okay now we understood in the three letters of nmr we discussed a lot about nuclear spin okay spin physics we understood we understood magnetism of the nuclear spins but now we have to see the resonance that means we have to see the nmr peaks nmr spectrum we have to see how do you see that we have to induce what is called some resonance okay what is that resonance when two frequencies match you call it resonance now how do you induce resonance here in the when you want to see the resonance in nmr the first condition is the spins must undergo transitions from alpha state to beta state and vice versa we have two energy states let us say For spin half nuclei, there are spins in this energy state. There are spins in this energy states. In their two energy states, that's what we have been discussing. And we also said there are more population, more spins in the lower energy state compared to that of higher energy state. That's what we discussed. Okay. that's what we discussed when we understood boltzmann population distribution <laughs> but if how do the spins undergo transition from alpha to beta and beta to alpha remember the probability of spontaneous emission is strongly frequency dependent so spins when it has to go there are several ways there are at least two or three ways which you must know one is spontaneous emission from one state to another state other is stimulated emission or stimulated absorption at the radio frequency region because the spontaneous emission is proportional to frequency q and which is of the order of 100 megahertz in the radio frequency region the spontaneous emission probability is much much lower it has a very low probability so spontaneous emission is practically you can ignore it then what is the next possibility we have to think of stimulated absorption or stimulated emission okay that is the only possibility we have to think of how do you do that let us say i have population distribution in two energy states like this i have to induce resonance by stimulating in absorption or emission by sending another radio frequency signal which which is an oscillating one which oscillates at the larmer frequency it must be an oscillating electromagnetic field as a radio frequency okay rf signal at the same frequency it, it must be the larmer frequency only then the frequency matches when the frequency matches what happens you apply the radio frequency pulse in a particular direction that is in a direction perpendicular to the magnetic field the spins absorb energy and then it go from lower energy state to higher energy state and come down from higher energy state to lower energy state this is called transitions the transition takes place 
simultaneously from alpha to beta states beta state and from beta state to alpha state so spins this is called flipping of the spins from alpha to beta state and beta to alpha state this is called resonance when the incident incident radio frequency signal rf is at the larmer frequency okay with this now i'll introduce another term called random phase approximation and the concept of bulk magnetization remember in earlier times one or two times i used the term magnetization and i said i will discuss it later let us understand what is magnetization let us consider individual magnetic moments at equilibrium in magnetic moments means individual nuclear spins look at them individual magnetic moments we knew we have discussed many times they are all aligned in, in two possible orientations for spin of nuclei that the restricted orientation for in the direction of the field in the direction opposite to that of the field and in an external magnetic field they undergo precision larmer precision okay larmer precision when they undergo there are millions and millions of such individual magnetic moments they all start processing like this and they process like a cone because it is making an angle in the direction of the magnetic field so if i look at even in the thermal equilibrium condition if i look at individual magnetic moments they are not static they are undergoing precession like this and mu is magnetic moment i said is a vector you can resolve into three components x and y and z components the all this component mu x and mu y, mu y also start oscillating so much as a consequence of precession and mu is not always ally, aligned along b it is constantly changing individual magnetic moment is constantly changing because, because of precession but now let us make let us go and understand little bit more taking only one of the magnetic moment okay if we take only one of the magnetic moment it has two states alpha and beta states each is a vector now we can resolve each vector into three components x y and z let us take first example the alpha alpha state of the one of the magnetic moment this orientation this vector now when we resolve into three components this individual nuclear moments have all the probabilities okay we will go here the if if a i'm sorry if i take the individual components there are there are x and y components for this now i will take all of them together what will happen each vector yes has x y and z component because they are undergoing precession x and y if i consider in the x y plane there is every probability of this vectors in this x y plane if there is a component along x axis or y axis in this direction there is you can always find another vector in the opposite direction when you take the vector addition of all of them what will happen either the x component or y component if you take they get nullified each of them gets nullified so as a consequence in the xy plane the probability of finding these components is not there at all it is zero x and y components are zero the vector sum of the nuclear magnetic moments in the xy plane is totally zero what about the z component if i go to the z direction here the component of the z direction are in the same direction look at it they are not zero they are all aligned in the same direction now what you can do is do the vector addition of all of them all these components you do vector addition then you are going to get some magnetization 
the vector addition has a some value which is sum of all those things okay some vector you are going to get a big vector after ordering all these things okay now <clears throat> apply the same analogy for the beta component that is beta orientation of the magnetic moment again for all this as i said both these alpha and beta components are processing in the form of a cone even for the beta components the xy components gets get completely nullified both these components get nullified the vector addition of x and y components even for this orientation of the all the magnetic moments is zero the vector addition is zero <clears throat> sorry as a consequence what will happen to this one again z1 minus z x in the direction opposite to that of the magnetic field this z component still there is some significant value the vector addition is non zero so the, in both the directions along the z and the direction opposite to z axis the vector addition has, has component of the magnetization which are non zero both are present in the z axis but we also know what happens <clears throat> we also know from our boltzmann population distribution there are more spins in this direction than in this direction than in the direction opposite to magnetic field so if the vector addition if you take this vector addition has a more magnitude than this one the magnitude of the vectors added up here let us say th this is i'll say m alpha is more than m beta so now again these two vectors in the opposite direction m alpha and m beta if you add up these two the total vector sum in this direction and the total vector sum in this direction because they are in the opposite direction part of it gets nullified but not completely because there are more spins in this direction so eventually you are going to be left with some amount of magnetization or so vector sum of all these components in this direction this is called magnetization this is called a bulk magnetization which is nothing but the vector sum of difference of magnetization from all the magnetic moment put together by an approximation called random phase approximation as a consequence all the components along x y plane is zero in the transverse plane and vector addition gives you a bulk magnetization which is non zero in the direction of the magnetic field you can treat this as a small tiny magnet this is the concept of bulk magnetization now i am going to tell you what happens to this bulk bulk magnetization in equilibrium and how can you perturb it to detect the signal so this you have to understand we will discuss this in the next class